Today I'm going to talk about uh, hydrogen and uh, how it might be important in a low carbon future. So anyone who's seen a rocket launch has seen hydrogen in action. It's the lightest element and has the highest energy density per kilogram, but it is not particularly uh, volumetrically dense, which we'll talk about in a minute. And although hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, it's actually really hard to find it in its hydrogen molecule form because it tends to stick to things uh, like oxygen, for example, to make water. And water is really good, but it's really annoying if you want to find hydrogen to use it as a fuel. And in fact, hydrogen is so hard to find on its own, it's not really considered a fuel, it's considered an energy carrier. That means you have to put energy in to, to make it on the hope that you're going to get energy back out at the other end. But notice the structure of hydrogen. Couldn't be much simpler, right? Two hydrogen atoms, no carbon. When you use it, you don't get any carbon dioxide. So how do you make it? So the most common way of making hydrogen at the moment is uh, steam reforming of methane. But that produces lots of carbon emissions, which can be sequestered potentially. But today we're going to focus on the use of renewable electricity to make hydrogen. So first of all, uh, electricity is passed through an electrolyzer. Uh, which splits the water into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And then to make the electricity low carbon, you use renewable energy into it. So then you end up with low carbon hydrogen or green hydrogen. But hydrogen's not very dense, as I said. So to actually be able to take it somewhere uh, any, over any long distance, you need to turn it into a carrier. So there are a number of different carriers around. Uh, you can liquefy it at very low temperatures. You can attach it to toluene. The one we've recently looked at with some work with the South Australian government is ammonia as the carrier. But then you've now got an energy dense carrier that you can use to export renewable energy to other countries. Uh, and that's quite a breakthrough, I think, um, especially if you're in a country where you've got lots of neighbours around you perhaps don't like so much and you don't want to create transmission lines to their country. So um, let's get to the thermodynamics part, shall we? So as I said earlier, produce hydrogen with a view to consuming the energy you put in later on. So you start with electrolysis. So again, like I was saying, splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. So when you do that, you don't get all the energy back out as hydrogen at the other end. There's about a 28% loss at the moment. That's at 55 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen production. You don't get that back. Next, you want to make it a bit more dense. So in this case, we're talking about ammonia. So there's a nitrogen and three hydrogens. You attach the hydrogens to the nitrogen to carry them in a more dense form. Um, that process is actually an exothermic reaction. So you get some uh, heat come off that you can use to drive utilities and electricity generation to run the plant. There is a slight loss in the process. So let's call that about a 1% loss, not, not so, too serious. But then you have to get the carrier from where you made it to where you want to use it. So generally that's a ship. So for ammonia again, that's relatively straightforward. There's existing uh, shipping channels using LPG carriers to get it from one country to another. So similar to oil uh, transport, let's say that's about 5% uh, energy loss in that step. Now that can be the carrier. You can actually use ammonia as the fuel in this case, or the liquid hydrogen, toluene, um, or you can use uh, normal ship bunker fuel. But now you have your carrier when you need it, you've got to turn it back into hydrogen to use it. CSIRO are currently working on this uh, membrane technology and they're looking to do a demonstration very soon where it decomposed ammonia passes through a metal membrane to create uh, fuel cell grade hydrogen. But there's some losses of hydrogen in there and you also have to compress the hydrogen at the end up to about 700 times atmospheric pressure to go into your vehicles. So losses there, um, there's about 15% losses in that step. So finally, you've got your fuel in your car, and you think, right, we're ready to go. But then you've got to take the hydrogen, combine it with oxygen from the air in the fuel cell to make water and some electricity. So then the electricity is used in the car to charge a battery. So hydrogen vehicles are actually battery electric vehicles with a charger on board. That's how they work. Uh, there's about 8% losses going into the battery and back out, uh, and about 40% losses in the uh, fuel cell itself. So then you've got electricity in the battery and you're driving your motors and there's a bit of loss in the motor. Finally, your car moves forward 7,000 kilometres away from where you made the uh, hydrogen potentially and generated the electricity. Uh, so there's about a 5% loss in those motors. Step through, you're making losses at every step. So you end up with about 30% of the original electricity in motion to move you forward in the car. 
So you're asking yourself now, what? why would you do that? Throw away 70% of that electricity to make that car move forward on the other side of the world. Well, to understand that, we need to think about both the supply and the demand ends of that, uh, that supply chain. So at the supply end, intermittent renewable electricity generation can lead to times when there's excess generation. So if you look in these graphs, we've got wind generation on the top graph over a seven day period. And there's one day where it obviously looks pretty awesome and pretty consistent. Uh, other days where it's not quite the same. Uh, you look at the bottom, there's 30 days of solar generation. You can see there's a pretty nice daily pattern there, but some days you don't get much at all, and some days you're getting quite a lot. Um, so hydrogen electrolyzers can absorb some of that excess electricity to create hydrogen, uh, which can then be sold as a product, if, if the alternative is, is curtailing it. Um, it can also, when there's times of shortage of generation, uh, the load can be quickly reduced. So therefore, uh, instead of bringing on more generation, you reduce um, some megawatts of uh, electrolyzer capacity, and then you can balance your load and generation. So electrolyzers can potentially uh, help balance electricity grids, but what about at the demand end? This is Japan's energy consumption, and you can see dominated by fuels that perhaps come from Australia. Coal, natural gas, and uranium, and also crude oil, obviously. So if countries like this seek a lower carbon future, they may want to move away from some of those um, more fossil fuel-based uh, uh, sources. And um, hydrogen might be able to unlock some of those. So let's look at transport first. So hydrogen fuel cell and battery electric vehicles offer an opportunity not only for low carbon uh, transport, but also reduced noise and air pollution, and particularly in cities. And you'll notice that there's been a few announcements in the last few weeks about, or months about countries deciding that in the next 15 to 20 years they're actually going to ban the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles. So that's moving in a, in a definite direction. But as a definite example of that opportunity, um, South Korea is currently converting 26,000 natural gas buses to hydrogen over, th over 13 years. And so that starts getting interesting to think about what the... Um, the implications of that might be for the hydrogen supply chain. So we've, we've done some estimates and we think it would take about $15 billion in investment to produce that hydrogen um, and deliver it to the, um, South Korea. And another $15 billion of in investment in renewable energy to supply the electricity to those electrolyzers. So to put that in perspective, um, current renewable energy generation in South Australia, which we've just recently been looking at, is around 2,400 megawatts. 26,000 buses would require 11,000 megawatts of solar PV to be installed. And I also say that the electrolyzers could help with the grid stability issues in South Australia as well. But what about stationary energy? So power generation and boilers. This is currently dominated by coal and natural gas. What about if electrolyzer efficiency was to increase a bit further? Um, Renewable energy costs were to continue to decline, perhaps as low as $10 a megawatt hour for, in some countries. Um, you know, and a low loss hydrogen carrier is developed, so you don't get such big losses in those transformations. Um, then maybe hydrogen could become a low carbon export fuel. And maybe it could even undercut the delivered price of LNG into some of those Southeast Asian countries. That could really be an industry that could take off for this country. Thanks everyone.